Hey, welcome to our study tonight on the book of James. We'll be halfway through in a couple more months, and uh, actually we're about halfway through now, and there is so much to cover, and today, get ready, there's a ton of scripture. Thank you once again for your faithfulness to this house, those of you that serve here, and those of you that also are furthering the vision in your giving. It has been incredible. We're sending funds around the world to South Africa, to Mexico, to India, for the things we're able to do here in Hemet around the United States. And you know what? It sounds like an old TV commercial. Uh, Hemet Church, thanks to you, it's working, and we do appreciate it. How are your relationships doing today? Think about them. Your marriage, your kids, your grandkids, if you're single today, and at the office, schoolmates. How are your relationships doing? A self-proclaimed, self-important woman, when I was pastoring back in 1991, uh, Church for All Nations, back in Tacoma, Washington, right after the fifth service I preached that morning, she came up to the altar. She says, Pastor, I have to talk to you. I said, yeah, what's up? And this is one of those women that she always, she, I got to be upfront with you, she graded on me. I had to work through my attitude there. Her husband was the prince of peace, and she was the princess of darkness at times, the way she would talk. She was a blurter. Whatever she thought, she had to say it. If she could think it, even if she wasn't thinking, she'd say it, you know, stinking think it. And she said, God spoke to me during the service. I'm thinking, praise God about your attitude, I'm thinking, maybe about how you talk to your pastor, uh, about your conduct. But she says, I want to tell you something. God spoke to me. And told me I'm going to work full time for you. I said, God told you that? No, I knew there was not a possibility God told me that. And I was praying and hoping and believing he would never tell me something like that. And I said, God told you? Absolutely, it's God. Thus saith the Lord. And I said, listen, dear. I won't tell you her name. I said, listen. I have a whole bunch of people in this church that don't like me for free. Why would I pay somebody to not like me? <laughs> this was one of the sweetest. Most of the people we pastored <clears throat> here, that we do pastor in Hammond, and we pastored back in, uh, at, at CFAN, Church for All Nations, man, such servants. And they added such value. They had the gift of help. She had the gift of hurts, if you will. But you know something, friends? It's important we recognize that God still puts a demand on me, not just as your pastor, but as a believer to really be mindful of how do I treat other people. As we continue in the book of James, we're studying how James examined four basic Christian doctrines against the backdrop or in light of the way we treat people. There's doctrine. There's actual doctrine and scripture behind how we are supposed to treat people. Thus far, you probably recall that we've explore, explored two of the doctrines. Here's a little side note. I want you to think of somebody right now you're not treating well. Or somebody who's deeply hurt you, so therefore your rationale is you can treat them any way you want and talk about them any way you want. And that's just not necessarily so. In fact, it's necessarily so that that ain't true. I want you to think of somebody you're hurting right now. Maybe you've been dumping in their garden. You've been bringing toxicity to their life. This is for you. This is for me. But the four doctrines that actually do address how we treat people is, first of all, the deity of Christ. He is Lord. James tells us that where the doctrine of the lordship of Christ is observed, meaning I'm going to do whatever Jesus tells me to do, there should never be any sign of favoritism. Isn't it amazing? The Lord actually takes a doctrine of God's deity, his lordship, and says, if you really believe I'm Lord, you're going to do what I say to do, and you're going to see things the way I see it. And you're going to understand what Jesus meant when he said, I do nothing that I have not seen my father do. Can you imagine that? None of us have an earthly father where we can say there's nothing he's done that I'm going to do also. I mean, anything I've seen him do, I mean, and nothing I do, rather, is going to be of my own self. It's going to be whatever dad did. No, we are individuals, and it's a little different. But with the heavenly father, with Jesus, as Jesus was in this world, so are we called to be. The second doctrine that we concluded with just this, uh, last week was the grace of God. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. One person put it this way, mercy is not getting what you deserve. 
and we're not getting death. The wages of sin is death. Uh, grace, that's mercy. Not getting what you deserve. Uh, grace is getting what you don't deserve, and that is mercy. Uh, that, that, I'm sorry, that is unmerited favor and, 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 and what we've already just shared with you. So the third doctrine for how we treat others that James examined was the word of God. This all comes together. How we look at the Bible, how we look at God's logos written word, rhema revealed word, sperma, the word we're impregnated with, the living word, how we treat one another it's also rooted doctrinally in the Word of God. Now, this is important we bring this out right now. Many of us, we always say, I'm a word nut, I just do what the Word says. It's ridiculous. You can do the entire Word, but if you don't first submit to the deity of Christ. The Lord says, why do you call me Lord and not do the things that I say you should do? He said, in that day you'll say, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we speak in tongues? Didn't we do all these neat things? And I'll say, and I'll say unto you, get away from me, you missed it. You do of iniquity. For I have never, gnosis, I've never known you. Never known you. So the deity of Christ is relevant to how we treat people. The grace of God is really key. Let our conversation be seasoned with salt. Let it be seasoned with grace. We're to give grace to people. The same measure of mercy we meet out, the same measure of grace we meet out. What, as a man sows, so shall he reap. That will be meted back to you. So the word of God, number three doctrine, for how we treat people. James looks at it in James chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. If ye fulfill the royal law, remember, love God, love others, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law, ooh, as transgressors. Wow. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, talking to the Jews now, the Torah, the whole law, and yet offend in one point, that's a jot or tittle, he is guilty of all. You've broken the whole law. That's how Judaism works. You break one law, you've broken the entire law. There's no quantitative analysis in Judaism. Well, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as my neighbor. He sins a lot more. He says, if you just break one jot, one tittle, one comma, one semicolon, you are guilty, convicted by the word and by God of being a total offender. That's why we need grace, 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 just a little bit of grace. And he says, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. But look what he says. Such a lawyer, man. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. How often does a person say, well, I lie. Yeah, I steal a little bit. I lie on my income tax. But it's not like I murdered anybody. And the Lord says, do you get this? I've come to fulfill the law, not abolish the law. But one jot or one tittle, if you're trying to be justified by the law, you'll be condemned by the law. If you try to be justified by the law, condemned by the law. If you break one little law, boom, you're breaking the whole thing. That's why so many of us in the church, we live under religion, condemnation, legalism, bondage. And we say, well, that person in the church is having a drink. And man, they're, they're getting drunk. And that person over there, I, I, I know the way they look at women in the church, man, maybe they're not doing it, but they're doing it in their heart or whatever the case is. And the Lord says, don't you get it? While you're judging other people, if you have one godless thought, if you have been unkind to one person one time, you've broken the entire law. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that's why we want to always default to grace. So here it is, the third doctrine, the word of God. In this day of liberal and social Christianity, the emerging church, they call it, which is a very interesting way of saying going away from the word. The emerging church, secularism, the worldliness in the church, and even atheism, people have waged war over the inspiration and authority of God's word. I'm not talking about different interpretations. A lot of godly people. I got a lot of friends that are very reformed in their theology, very Calvinistic, uh, once saved, always saved, predestination, and many of them are dynamic Christians. 
They're mighty Christians. I have other friends, hyper free will. You can do whatever you want to do. It's, the, it's allowable, it just isn't profitable, but you're choosing this day who you serve. You're choosing this day, blessings or cursings. Total free will. And you know what? I think there's a healthy tension between both positions. I'm not an extremist, but you know what? I've got friends that believe opposite of one another who are still dynamic believers. That's not what we're talking about. I have friends that believe if you have a glass of wine or two, it's no big thing. Jesus did. I have others that believe because of alcoholism, it is sin, it is wrong, it's a stumbling block. They're great friends. Let's, let's, let's raise a glass to them right now. Come on now. <laughs> I mean, they're great friends. And you know what? That's not a hill we're dying on. We're talking about people who have diluted the gospel, taken the nutritional value, uh, taken the, 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 the kernel of wheat, and they've taken all of the nutritional value out of it and replaced it with enriched flour, not, not something that's bad for you, something that absolutely does you no good whatsoever, but it looks like the same kind of bread. So we have this. See, it's a good thing to practice apologetics. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And give a sound defense for the word of God. Peter puts it this way. Be ready to give an answer always for the hope which lies within you. Jude tells us we are to contend for the faith. Stand up. Be able to do this. So I'm not saying that's not important. But you know what, friends? Uh, oh, apologetics is that just that. Defending the faith. Defending the faith. Being able to answer a lot of the cultural issues and a lot of the uh, post-Christian eras, uh, post-Christian era questions. Like if you go to Europe today, the overwhelming percentage of Europe, which was where we got our initial missionaries from, a ton of them came from England. There was a time that France had a heart for God. There was a time, well, Ireland, there was the Protestant Catholic wars that were going on. But today, we're entering into a post-Christian era in Europe, and it's beginning to happen here too where people have gone beyond the gospel, beyond the inerrancy of scripture, and they're living what's called sacred secularism, which means their new worship, their new, that, that which they, that they hold in the highest of, of esteem is a secular or a humanistic, a self-initiative directed belief system, if you will. You see, it's a good thing to practice apologetics. I'm not suggesting we should know how to defend the faith. However, our lives are the ultimate defense of God's word. And I want to ask you, since you're a living book, since you're a living Bible, a living letter, a living epistle known and read of all men, I'm curious, how well does your life defend the word of God? I'm going to suggest today many children do not serve the Lord because they saw the duplicity and they saw the hypocrisy and incongruities in their parents' life. I think there's a lot of people that they'll come to the church and they see doctrine, they see dogma, and they see bylaws, but they do not see love. They do not see grace. They do not see mercy. They do not even see relevancy. Well, let me say it differently. They don't see relevancy. No, I don't want to say it differently. They don't see how our lives and our belief is relevant to what they're going through in life right now. D.L. Moody put it this way. Here's a guy that by the 1950s had led more people to Christ in his lifetime than any other person who ever lived before him. That includes Jesus. Led more people to Jesus than anybody, more than the Apostle Paul. Just an amazing thing. He did that without social media. Who would have thought? Anyway, D.L. Moody put it this way. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. I love that. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns. Every Bible should be bound in shoe leather. Here's the funny part. D.L. Moody had a fifth grade education, and here's a guy who was a shoe salesman. He tore up selling shoes, and now he took all of his energy and all of his salesmanship, and he turned it into bringing hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus Christ. James reaches back to the Old Testament for one of the foundational principles of Scripture. Le you remember I said James is the what? Leviticus of the New Covenant. Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. Say that. Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, remember the Jews hated the Samaritans. 
wanted nothing to do with them. They go a full day's journey out of the way not to encounter a Samaritan. But you know Jesus, he got the word. He understood the doctrine of grace. He understood the doctrine of the deity of God. And so what does he do here? In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells us that our neighbor is anyone who needs our help. For devotions tonight, can I give you an idea from Luke 10, verse 25 to 37? I want you to read that parable again. There is so much there. You know, I've got a message the Lord's giving to me right now for the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'm telling you, friends, it was the least likely in Jewish conscience, Jewish thought, Jewish cognitive reasoning. It was the Samaritan who was the last person who would ever have done anything good, especially for a Jew. I mean, here you've got a Levitical priest, and here you have another priest that, uh, they're kind of the pastor of the church in today's terms, and they're walking by, and they go to the other side of the road, and they neglect the peril of a man who is in critical condition. He's been accosted, like on the streets of America today. It's like he's at one of these demonstrations, and he gets accosted, and these guys want nothing to do with it. Here's these men that they miss the weightier matters. They've neglected it. We talked about the other day, the weightier matters of love and mercy and, and, and compassion. They, they missed that whole thing. And they were great tithers on mint and cumin. They did the smallest little minutest detail, but they missed the big picture. A neighbor, Jesus teaches us, is not a matter of geography, but rather opportunity. Now, I love that, man. It's not a matter of geography. It's a matter of opportunity. Do you know, friends, God gives us opportunities, divine opportunities all the time. Is it possible every time you see a need, you should be compassionate? You shouldn't be compassionate and then see needs. That doesn't exist. It's not biblical compassion. The Bible says Jesus saw the need, and then, or therefore, he was moved with compassion. He saw the need. And this brought him to a position in Christ of compassion. Some of us need to let the scales fall from our eyes, the veil of religiosity be lifted from our face. Some of us need to not so be caught up with the glory of God and I just have to be in his presence. Some of us need to let other people be in our presence. Some of us need to look at the park. Some of us need to look at the streets. Some of us need to look at the different venues in our own city where we're living right now, wherever you're at, and say, how do you respond? What are you moved with when you see a need? Is it indignation? Is it a judgmental spirit? Is it condescension? I'm not my brother's keeper. I didn't cause the problem. I got to take care of my own family. But the Bible says a true believer, when you see the need, you will be moved. You're called to be moved with compassion. Your neighbor, friends, is whatever opportunity you see. When I'm on an airplane, I've got two airplane rides that are scheduled. Actually, i got four scheduled right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And you know what? I'm going to see some needs. I look for needs. I, I, I search them out. And I find when I see that need, I'm moved with compassion. People say, Pastor, I'm so sorry to bother you right now. When I see an authentic need and you really want help, it stirs up a spirit of compassion inside of me. I think that maybe does that for you too. If not, I think it will by the end of our message or the end of the series for sure, for sure, if you will. But the important question is not, who is my neighbor, but to whom can I be a neighbor? Not who's my neighbor. It's so flippant. It's so arrogant. It's so dismissive. Not who is my neighbor, but to whom can I be a neighbor? Can you be a neighbor to that parent you've rejected today? Can you be a neighbor to that individual who's defrauded you? Can you be a, yeah, love your enemy. (laughs) Can you be a neighbor when you're exhausted? Can you be a neighbor when you feel you've been taken advantage of? And by the way, when you see a person lying in the street, bleeding, and the church has thrown them out, they've been rejected by the priest and the Levite. I just want to ask you, who is their neighbor? If not you, then who? If not now, then when? Why is love thy neighbor called the royal law? And really the royal law is love God, love others. 
love God, love your neighbor. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the other law is just like it. Love your neighbor in the same way you love yourself. Why is it called the royal law? And here's the reason. It's real basic. The Jews will tell you this out of Deuteronomy. There's a reason for it. And out of Leviticus. Because the law was given by Melcha alone, king of the universe. It was given by Yahweh. It was given by I am who I am, the great I am. God the Father, Abba, gave it in the law. God the Son reaffirmed it to his disciples, and I believe it's John 13, verse 34. God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, fills our heart with God's love and expects us to share it with others. That's why the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. The love of God literally originates in your heart because God lives in your heart. You have a soft heart. And since as he was in this world, so are you. That's why the Bible says his love should overflow from us to others. A statement I make all the time, and I'm going to make it right now. Uh, many of us here are incapable of loving. I am. You know, I don't know how many of you have gotten to know uh, my daughter, Trisha, totally incapable of loving. Oh, another offender? Right on staff here, full time. Maddie Zipper, she's not capable of loving. Let me just complain about it right now as long as we're talking about my wife, Marge. She can't love. She don't love me like I love me. You see, none of us are capable of love because it says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. You know what it says? Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. That's in verse 7. For love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth him. But it says if you don't love, you don't know God because God is love. What's our takeaway? It takes God to love God. God. That's why the love of God has to be shed abroad in our heart. If he don't do it, it ain't going to happen. He has to do it. Why don't you just ask the Lord right now, Lord, let your love captivate me. Let it capture me. Lord, let, I mean, I'm your temple. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. I need your love to be shed abroad in my heart. Since it takes God to love God, all you have to do is fully accept Christ and realize we do not produce agape, unconditional love on our own. Phileo love you can do, brotherly love. Uh, eros love, looking for the most beautiful and aesthetic and, and uh, the most desirable. We can all do that. We do that. It often leads to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But to love God or to love others when there's no reciprocity, you get nothing in return. Now, my friend, that takes God. It takes God to love God. It takes God to love others. Romans 5.5 5 puts it this way. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God, oh, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Why am I so into the baptism of the Holy Spirit being Filled with the Holy Spirit. Friends, I believe I received the Holy Spirit and I was sealed, like I told you last session, by the Holy Spirit when I got saved and when you got saved. Same thing. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, what does the Bible say the fruit of the Spirit is? Number one, and it's not plural, it's singular. You have to have them all. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, love, joy, peace. You got to love, love, love. It's really interesting that... Uh, was it Dionne Warwick, Warwick who sang, What the world needs now? She sang, it was written by Burt Backrack, I think, is love, sweet love. And she was right. But the world can't manufacture it. There's nothing we can do independent of Christ. True believers are taught of God to love one another. One of the plays we were rehearsing with the kids before COVID took place was We Like Sheep. And there's a song in there, love one another. We got to love one another, and we do. And I'm arguing that in the Jewish temple, 
there was a lot of legalistic love. We were obligated, the word said so, and so we had to manufacture a synthetic kind of love, not real love. But now that we have Jesus, and we incarnate Jesus, the fullness of the God that dwells within us. So we learned in our last passage that it's the Holy Spirit that causes love to be shed abroad in our heart just because he comes to live in us. And so you got to see this now. you got to see this. I said, when I come to the church, everybody is going to just love one another. But I wonder, is that really true? And the answer was a resounding no. I'm amazed how many people in the church do not even know one another. People that have been in the church for 26, 30 years, whatever it is, never go to one another's homes. They don't spend time together. It all happens in more of a country club-esque environment. And I'm telling you, friends, here at Hemet Church, we're breaking that spirit. And I'm not saying that we had a problem. This is a real friendly church. It's a relational church, a loving church. But all that being said, we need to get our love. It's like the series that I'm doing right now, Sunday mornings beginning the first Sunday of November, I believe. In fact, it is. And that is get your seed out of the barn. If Christ is in you, there's love in you, and the seed of love is in you. But you need to get it out of the barn. But true believers are taught by God to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not, Paul says, that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. What's Paul saying? You don't need a New Testament revelation today. You don't need to wait for the Gospels that are not even written yet. He says, you don't need a Jesus word right now. He says, you, already have ta- you, you are taught of God. It, it's already been taught to you in the Old Covenant. It's taught to you in the Torah. It's taught to you beautifully in the book of Hosea, a husband who loves a whoring wife, cheating on him, prostituting around, but not really prostitution because it was all for free. He says, you've already been taught the importance. But he says, what are you doing? You're loving riches. You're loving social status. You're loving economic position. Instead of genuine, authentic love. Love thy neighbor is the royal law for an additional reason. It supersedes all the other laws we are given towards our fellow man. What? There are laws that are more important than other laws. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, what does the Bible say? That's why it's important. You got to get this. Get a little closer. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to what? Fulfill the law. So did he, fulfill, did he fulfill every single one of them? Yes. But look at how he says it. Romans 13, 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. That means how we talk to them, how we treat them, how we meet their needs, how we cover their back. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. We're told in Scripture, if you fulfill the royal law, love God, love others, you fulfill the entire law. The entire law! And it's a basic thing, but I want to ask you, how are you loving your enemies today? How are you loving those who have spitefully used you? How how are you loving those who have done evil to you? I'm asking myself the same question. This is a struggle. But I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Law, the law says we die for our sins, and God, this is key, God's love sends Jesus to die for us. This is the key. The wages of sin is death. He knew who he knew no sin. So right now, first one, wage of sin is death, is saying that we die for our sins. But then Jesus Christ came and said, instead of you dying for your sins, I'm going to die for your sins. An amazing thing. When people hurt you or fail you, do you gravitate to the law or the royal law? The law says, you're a father, you're a mother, you know better, you shouldn't have done this, you've wounded me, and all you do is continue to throw the junk back in their face. Or you say, you know what? I think somebody died for that. I think somebody died for that. 
Whenever people really get intense with me about an area I've betrayed them or let them down, didn't even realize I was doing that, I failed them, I say, you know what, I think somebody died for that. But for you, for me, when somebody fails, do you cover them with the law, which is covering them with dirt, six feet underground, and saying this is terminal, it's over, you're past the point of no return? Or do you cover them with the royal law? I love God, therefore his love is shed abroad in my heart, and I love you. Love will cover a multitude of sins. You see, it was Shem and Japheth walking backwards and covering their father up who was in deep sin at that moment. When people hurt you or fail you, do you gravitate to the law or the royal law? Meditate. Chew on that for a while, if you will. There would be no need for the thousands of complex laws of if each of us truly loved God and loved our neighbors. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, so instead of having all these other commandments, there's a lot of commandments that heaven declares and nature declares and it's already innate and even an atheist knows about a lot of these laws. Even an atheist who doesn't believe in God. But if we truly loved God and loved others, you wouldn't have to put any other laws on people. They would automatically and naturally move in that direction. One of the main reasons this is the royal law is living by the law, living by this law, not the law, this law, this version of Torah, this love God, love others. God's saying, I'm distilling the entire law into two laws, which is really one, love. It's the law of love, but it's the love of God and the love of of others. So here it is. Living this living by this law is the ultimate earmark that you are a citizen of the kingdom. Now love doesn't mean sloppy agape. Love doesn't mean oh no big thing we all sin. Love doesn't mean you just look the other way and let a person take advantage. That's not what we're suggesting today. But when you look at hatred and bitterness, and unforgiveness, and self-centeredness, and narcissism. Friends, guess what? These are all earmarks of the kingdom of darkness. You see, you have the fruit of the Spirit, but you also have the fruit of flesh. You also have the fruit. You have hatred. You have murder. You have lying. You have all these other things. Just like there's an antichrist, there's Christ. There's always something anti to the real McCoy in Scripture. But hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment makes a person, oh, you got to see this, friends. What does it do? It makes a person a slave to the kingdom of darkness. And love is what liberates you and me to live as royalty. Because it's the royal law. It's the prodigal son returning home. His brother is all law, but the father's all grace. The son, in this case, doesn't get the spirit, the vibe, the heartbeat of the father. Love is what enables us. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Love is what enables us to obey the word of God and treat people as God would have us to. Friends, I can be harsh. At times, I can be judgmental. At times, I can be condescending. You have to admit these things. Say it out loud. Are you willing to confess your faults one to another? James is going to teach us. We have to confess our faults one to another to take the sting out of that sin that we're struggling with. See, friends, we do not obey God's word out of fear. Religion does that. We're called to obey his word out of love. Oh, let me read it again. John 14, 15, it's sneaking it again. If you love me. Keep my commandments. But I love the way it reads in the Greek. If you love me, the corresponding fruit will be fulfillment of what I told you to do. There'll be corresponding supporting evidence, if you will. Being a respecter of persons based on, oh, look at their social position. They're a social climber. Look at their money, do, re, me, 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 me. They've got some money. They've got economic status. Can disobey or can lead to disobeying all of God's word. 
Friends, I have to be so aware of this. If you come to Hemet Church, and let's say you give $1,000 a year, and another guy gives a half a million a year, and he's a multimillionaire, he has no regard for God, cheating on his wife, no desire. But I say, i got to make him an elder. I can't lose this giving, man. This is important. This is key to the financial backbone of this church. And the other person is just a thousand bucks. Why even put up with them? That's godless. That's sinful. That's unscriptural. We have to come to this place where we say, is there any area of my life where I'm a respecter of persons? I trust a white person, but not a black person. I trust a black person, but I can't handle a Chinese person. Or, Guys, do we realize when the Lord said, no, no man after the flesh, that was a mandate, a command, if you will. But when you become a respecter of persons in any area, you're in danger of disobeying, according to Paul and according to James, all of God's word. See, friends, love is foundational to the entire word of God. The word of God rests in love. God so loved the world. God so loved, he sent the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He sent Jesus. He sent us the word. Why? Because God so loved. What motivated God to come? What motivated God to help us to eliminate and erase our Adamic nature? What is it that motivated him to come and be love on the cross? Love. Love. Nothing more. Nothing less. If you respect a person based on social status, there is not any of the Ten Commandments you would not be capable of breaking. What? If you break this one, we're so, I never murdered anyone. I've, I've never had an idol. Uh, I've never coveted my neighbor's wife. Ba 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 boom. No, I've never done that. And the Lord says, don't you get it? The second you become a respecter of persons, you're still violating the scripture so when someone walks in our church doors and maybe you don't like the way they smell maybe you don't like their lack of economic status the lord says that's anathema accursed don't ever do it okay respect of a person's status can lead to lying defrauding defrauding exploiting this happened to lazarus the 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 the, the beggar you remember the rich man and that whole story we talked about last session? You see, friends, without even meaning to, when we're a respecter of persons, man, it can lead to covetousness. It can lead to lying to another person, telling them how wonderful they are, how great they are. You see, friends, respect of a person over God's word is what leads to all manners of other problems because, you see, God so loves people. God so loves the nation, the ethnos the goyim, the different nations of this world. Friends, God really loves the person who votes the opposite of you. God really loves the individuals that offend you. God really loves white people. He really loves black people and red and yellow and brown and, alas, even olive-skinned people. See, life is ultimately always a matter of God's word versus our own preferences. As I live my life, it always comes down to, thus saith the Lord. It comes down to God's word versus my own personal preferences. Come on, let's face it. Did you start coming to Hemet Church or the church you attend today because of personal preferences or because of God's word? I want you to think of it. A lot of folks, we choose a church because it doesn't preach God's word. It doesn't allow me to be convicted of my sins. It doesn't infer that there's areas of my life that I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Scripture says if I break one of God's laws, come on, a little test now, I've broken how many of them? All. All. Todo. Okay? Todas. All of his law. Scripture also says if I keep the royal law, just two laws. I fulfilled the rest of the law. I don't know about you, but I like that mathematical equation. How about you? See, friend, Scripture shows that love does what? This is why love is so powerful. It covers a multitude of sins. What is that telling you? This is key. It's telling us that Dom, which is the blood, 
uh, the Dom Yeshua, the blood of Jesus, it says that his blood will cleanse me and erase the sins in my life. Maybe not the consequences, and maybe the consequences, but he literally cleanses me from all unrighteousness. I'm now in absolute right standing with him. But there's times that I've not come to the mercy seat. I've not come boldly to the throne of grace. And the Lord says, with Yom Kippur, it was the blood of bulls, goats, heifers, and turtle doves that could cover, not cleanse your sins and help you get by for the next year. Then you can wait just a few months and at the pa- Passover, the Pesach, your family, you could atone for their sins like Job did for his kids and so on. But this is the kicker. This is what I want you to grasp today. That he's saying, well, it's no longer the blood of animals that covers you while you're waiting for your sins to be cleansed, but it's love. And he goes on and says, that's what Shem and Japheth had for their dad. It was God's love. It was the love in these two sons that caused them to go blindly, walk backwards, not in a judgmental, condescending way to cover their father's sins, if you will. Christian love does not mean that I must like a person and agree with him on all issues. How many of you can think of people in the church you don't agree with? If you can't, you got to get out more. You've not been doing a lot of thinking, okay? See, friends, unity does not presuppose unanimity. What does that mean? This is a big mistake in almost every church, friends, and probably almost every family. Achad, which is unity, oneness, the word used to describe the Father, Son, Holy Spirit being achad, one. Okay, unity does not mean we're unanimous, that we agree on everything. You can be an elder in this church and not agree with me, a deacon in this church and have areas you do not agree with me in. Now, don't look for areas not to, you know, to disagree with one another, but still, unity does not presuppose unanimity. A lot of us are so insecure when somebody corrects us, when somebody has a different view than us, or, God forbid, there's somebody in the, sh- in, in the church that thinks differently on a doctrine that's just very important to you, on a core value that's very important to you, we say we can no longer have unity. But here it is. As long as we're loving God and loving others, loving our neighbor as ourself, the Lord says we're going to have areas we do not agree on. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas were traveling together and doing great things for God. And then Barnabas brings his nephew, John Mark, on the road. Road trip! And John Mark says, I miss Mama's gefilte fish, and, and, I, and, and I miss her lox and bagel and corned beef and rye and, you know, and, 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 and potato lockies, you know, the potato pancakes. And so he goes home. He leaves the missions trip. Then he comes back and Paul says, sorry, dude, I I, I want warriors, not wimps, for the kingdom of God here. You are kicked off the team. And Barnabas says, Paul, don't do that. And the Bible goes on to say they had no small dispute. What does that mean? They had a big dispute. They had no small dispute. And so what happened as a result of it? Barnabas went with John Mark, and there was disunity. Because instead of Paul and Barnabas saying, hey, we disagree on this one issue, But it's still about souls. It's still about relationship. Remember what we say here at Hemet all the time. Relationships are the only thing we take with us into eternity. But the problem was Paul was taking bitterness and resentment and a judgmental spirit into eternity with them. Years later, it took house arrest. It took persecution. It took more experience with the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, listen, um, I made a mistake. I was out of kingdom order. That's what he's saying. He says, here's what I need you to do, guys. Bring my Bible with you. Bring my devotionals. Oh, oh, bring my commentaries. Oh, and can you do me a favor? I know you're not going to believe this coming out of my mouth. Bring John Mark with you. Bring my winter coat too, but bring John Mark. For he is profitable to me. I mean, he's profitable to the work of God, to the kingdom of God. Paul could see the value. By admitting, bring John Mark, he was saying, I screwed up. I blew it. I wonder, when you screw up, I know maybe you'd say you've never done that, but if, you know, just hypothetically speaking, you were to screw up, do you admit it? Are you open? See, when you love God, you'll keep his commandments. When you love God, you're going to spend time in his presence, and he'll say, Bill. If your name's not Bill, you might say something else, right? Say, Bill, 
This is an area you need to turn. You need to repent. Get right with God. See, friends, Christian love does not mean that all fellow believers will be my intimate friends. There are people I love from a distance. Hmm. There are people I love that, shall I say at times, they're toxic. They're dangerous. So it's from a distance. But but we have to be careful because some of us are doing that with our parents, with our kids. And there's certain unique tribal covenantal relationships there, like believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household shall be saved. What are you doing to jeopardize your loved one's salvation by your testimony, by your word, by your love for them, by having nothing to do with them? Christian love means treating others the way God has treated me. Let me just break it down for you. Christian love means treating others the way God has treated me. See, love is not an act of the will, okay? Or I'm sorry, I should say that differently. Love is an act of the will. Love is a verb. It's an action word. It's something you will to do. It's not based on feelings. But our problem is almost every love song today, every love song, almost every romantic movie, no, every romantic movie is based on feelings, nothing more than feelings, which, by the way, is not biblical because feelings are often the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. So love is often an act of the will, not an, not an emotion that I have manufactured. Love is born of God and is therefore designed to glorify God. Oh, I like that. Love is born of God and is therefore designed to glorify God. Love is the result of the power of the Spirit within each and every one of us. Because what do we say? Numero uno, the fruit of the Spirit is love. When I walk in the Spirit and thus walk in love toward another, I will be drawn closer to my source of love, God. Why? I'm saying, God, you're my oxygen. I'm breathing in you, I live and move and have my being, my essence. Lord, I can't love this person unless you do it. You need to work in my life, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. I will begin to see that person through Christ's eyes. What, what, what did Christ see? Needs. Then what happens? Compassion. Then what happens? He came because he so loved. I will then begin to see qualities, potential, and gifts in that person that my natural eyes have missed. That my natural eyes have missed. Do you know Christian love never leaves a person where you found them? What? Love always builds up and never tears down. The good Samaritan, when Jesus told the story of the good Samaritan, they were thinking like the story of Purim with the story of Esther and Mordechai and Haman and King Ahasuerus. Every time a Jewish child goes to the festival of Purim and we celebrate how God delivered the Jews from mass genocide, another type Hitlerian situation. Every time they would mention Mordechai's name, he was the hero, everyone would go, yeah! Go Mordechai, not Mordechai, not Mordechai, it's Mordechai. Every time they say Esther, yeah, yeah, Esther, Esther, she's our girl. If she can't do it, give it a whirl. I mean, she was so key. And when they say Haman, we all go, boo, boo. That was the whole concept. Well, the good Samaritan would be like a Haman. The Jews looked at the Samaritans as dirt. They looked at them as reprobates. But the good Samaritan could not leave this victim he found in the center of the road. Love extends the touch of healing. Jesus sees uh, Bartimaeus, blind from birth. What would you have me do for you, Bartimaeus? Lord, I just want to see. I just am sick and tired of begging I'm tired of rejection. I've got the spirit of rejection on me. I want to see son of David, son of David, please have mercy on me. Lays hands on him. And the guy's instantly healed. Love extends the healing touch. The woman with the issue of blood, she touches the talis, the tzitzit, the little fringe 
When it says the hem of Jesus' garment, that's what it would have been, Rabbi Jesus, and grabs hold of it, and she perceives healing virtue flowing through her body. See, friends, people are not healed, according to Francis McNutt, the Catholic priest who wrote an incredible treatise on healing. And uh, this guy's charismatic man, loved the Lord, believes in the gifts. And he said this, people are not, due, are not healed due to a lack of faith, but rather a lack of... Let me try that one again. People are not healed due to a lack of faith, but due to a lack of love. What? Well, the Bible says faith only works by love. Faith may be your car, but love is what fuels it. It's the petroleum. It's the electricity if it's a Tesla. People are not healed, or people are not not healed due to a lack of faith, but because of a lack of love, he said. God so loved the world, you realize love changes the atmosphere? Love changes the environment. You know, I would like to go to Mars. Some of the people listening to my message now would like for me to go to Mars without oxygen. But I would like to go to Mars. Just always wanted to do that. More than the moon, I want to go to a planet. Maybe it's because I used to watch that TV series, Dee, 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 My Favorite Martian with Uncle Martin and Tim and Bill Bixby. You remember those days? And, and I, I just really kind of love the idea, but I'm not going to live unless I bring my own atmosphere with me, and that's oxygen. And that's also a cooling down for the temperature due to the, the, the nature of the calejante, the heat, the hotness of that planet. But here's what I think you'll find amazing. As a Christian, since you're not a thermometer that tells the temperature, as you've heard me say, you're a thermostat that changes the temperature, we Christians are called to bring our own atmosphere wherever we go. And it's an atmosphere of the love of God being shed abroad in our heart. What kind of atmosphere do you bring to a party? What kind of atmosphere are you going to bring this Thanksgiving to a family gathering? What kind of atmosphere do you bring into your office your factory, your warehouse? What kind of atmosphere do you bring into your home? Atmosphere. We are called to bring an atmosphere of love. I love it because God so loved the world, love changed the whole environment. When Jesus came to this planet, it changed everything. Did you know that love is moved with compassion? Love is to a Christian what water is to a fish. Without it, we flop around ineffectually. I mentioned that recently. We only believe as much of the Bible as we practice. Let me say that again. You only believe, I only believe as much of the Bible as I practice. Because, friends, the parts of the, of, 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 of the Bible I don't practice, maybe I don't think it's essential. Maybe I don't really believe it after all. You see, friends, if we fail such a vital component as the royal law, and loving our neighbor as ourself, then we will not do very much with the lesser matters of the word. Remember, Jesus said, you can tithe all you want, but don't neglect the weightier matters of love, of justice, of mercy. This is the love, this is the justice, this is the mercy. And how many people neglect that? Huh. If we fail, friends, this is where the Pharisees failed. They were careful about the minor matters of the word. Remember we talked about Matthew 23, 23 last time. They were careful about the minor matters of the word, and they were careless about the fundamentals. They continuously broke the very law they thought they were defending. Now, that's amazing. We, as believers, are called to give an answer always for the hope which lies within us. We are to contend for the faith. We're to live it as he was in this world. So are we. The love of God is to be shed abroad in our heart. That's why the old covenant tells us, oh, what manner of love the Father's bestowed upon us. That's what causes us to be called the sons of God and the bride of Christ. But for you, for me, how many of us love to defend the word? We love to argue every jot, every tittle. I was sharing with somebody today, what we do is we swallow, the Bible says, we, 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 we somehow or other, and I want you to see this, he says, we somehow or other avoid ingesting a gnat, but we swallow a camel. He says, well, I'm going to give you the picture. 
A gnat, back in the time of Jesus, was considered to be the smallest non-kosher member, not fit to eat, non-kosher member of the animal kingdom. A camel they looked at as the largest land animal that was non-kosher. Remember, kosher, you had to chew your cud and have a cloven hoof, and a camel ain't kosher, plus the dude spits. That's, that's just not, not good behavior, right? And, and, and so Jesus said, you strain a gnat. He says, you take like a piece of cloth, a cheesecloth, and you put it on your vessel for libations, for drinks. And he says, and you put it on top, and you turn it over, and it was very porous, and the liquid would come through, and a little gnat could not get out. And he says, you're really taking care of the minor part of keeping the kosher laws. But he says, you're choking to death on a camel, dude. You're choking to death on a camel. How many of us were so good at the little things in the gospel, but we miss the most basic truth of love God, love others? We're going to get together this next Thursday, and we're going to cover this next doctrine. It's judgment. It's judgment. The Bible, there is a love side of God, but there is a judgment side of God as well. You're not going to want to miss this. But I want to ask you today, do you love God? Do you love God? Do you love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength? And do you love your neighbor, even if they're not likable, as you love yourself? Jesus says we can't do the gospel. We can't be a living epistle known and read of all men that's worth reading, um, worth, worth abiding with, if we don't get the weightier matters of love God and love others in kingdom order. Friends, you may say today, I don't think I can do this, Bill. I get it. I feel the same way. But can I give you some great news that will hold you till next week? You can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you.